Welcome again back to our podcast, Cosmic Careers Podcast, with Alistair Brown, along with Veronica Chiaravalli. Hello, and today we will cover Settling the Moon, and we will start from the very beginning. That is correct. Today is Chapter 9 of the podcast, and after today, there will be two more podcasts on this book. Since we've covered habitats and factories in space and working in low Earth orbit, the moon is the next logical step in the development and settlement of space. Right, and it's very important that we discuss this because the moon is obviously going to play a very major role in settling space, so we are going to have to cover this from the very beginning. We are not just going to build a moon base and settle on it. This will have to be a very well thought out plan. There have been separate proposals for a lunar settlement with three different functions. What are these functions that have been proposed? One, scientific investigation of the moon. Two, development of lunar resources for industries on Earth, in space, and on the moon itself. Three, the development of a self-sufficient and self-supporting lunar base with habitats eventually leading to a lunar city and beyond. But that is in the future. It's obvious why all three functions need each other. No one single function can survive without the other two. Now that we have the bare bones of what is needed, we will now start from the beginning. Meaning we will finally land on the moon again after a 50 plus year absence. We will then start to build our settlement. Building a settlement may start soon after we land on the moon. At present, it is planned that the astronauts will travel and land on the moon with the SpaceX Starship, where they will explore the moon a few days, then lift off again. This would be the first mission, a repeat of Apollo. Subsequent missions will begin to bring construction machinery and small modules of what would later make up the base, but it would be built slowly. Cargo landers will deliver space station-derived facilities, starting with habitats. In constructing a base, it is necessary to bring in the required materials of a base in their proper order. First, the cargo landers would come but there would have to be construction equipment ahead of time to move the habitats to their required locations, like cranes to lift and move habitats and other facilities. Robots may even be required to help build the base before any human arrives. They and the construction equipment would be the first to arrive on the moon for the base. Other construction equipment, like skip loaders and energy-driven shovels, will need to dig the regolith and cover the habitats two meters deep to protect it from cosmic and solar radiation and those occasional solar flares. Now the habitats are set up for a certain number of people, 6, 12, maybe 20, all for needed professions, skills, and trades. Once they are on the moon, they all need to get down to work immediately. The next two facilities would be power plants, probably nuclear, to provide electricity for what they are going to do and a small farm to grow their own food. This could come from a greenhouse using hydroponics at first, but later lunar soil after it has been processed. By this, I mean removing metals and putting in organic materials, including human waste. The interior of the habitats can be designed in such a way to require interior decorators to add life to living on the moon with artistic designs, whatever the inhabitants may desire. There will be plenty of jobs for that later as we progress. So now we have electrical power and a source of food to cut down on food imports, which will still be needed for a while. New recipes with the food being produced can be imagined. Chefs will be required here. Also brewers. Imagine growing barley on the moon and brewing it into beer. I would love to taste that. Mm. What is needed is a laboratory for scientists to analyze the lunar soil for minerals. 
This means going out and taking samples, even drilling in the ground. Then they examine these mineral samples and figure out how to process them. Almost all minerals found on the moon are bonded with oxygen in one form or another. Separating the oxygen from these materials would provide an abundant air supply for the lunar inhabitants, and the minerals would be pure enough for later manufacturing of needed materials. I will get into this shortly. One element that is greatly needed is water. The moon does have an ample supply of it in the form of ice at its poles. They are permanently in shadowed areas where it always remains at an extreme sub-zero temperature, and this is where the ice remains. According to NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, LRO, spacecraft, it has been indicated that ice may make up as much as 22% of the surface material in Shackleton Crater. This would be enough to supply water for drinking, agricultural use, and rocket fuel. In the case of fuel, water would be passed through electricity known as electrolysis and split into hydrogen and oxygen. Ships would land on the moon, be refueled with these two elements, and mixing them would produce massive thrust with water as a byproduct. The moon can then function as a refueling station. The scientists would have to find ways to process this ice, melt it into water, and then have it distributed to where it is needed. This is now where life on the moon diversifies. We now have the living arrangements set up being the habitats, food sources, power sources, laboratories for mineral and water ice, in addition to astronauts exploring the nearby areas of their camp perhaps even further with their lunar rovers. We now begin to set up pilot plants to process the minerals that were found. We manufacture small items that are needed, like parts for habitats, computers, machinery, including construction machinery, and robots. There could be a small business manufacturing these items to sell to other space stations, space habitats, and space factories to help support the lunar settlement and wean them off of the budget of other countries supporting this base. In order for a base to survive, it must eventually pay for itself, and this is a step-by-step -step way to help make it do so. After the pilot processing plant makes the products in a normal fashion and expands, Larger manufacturing plants would come into being. There are two ways to do this. One, build plants on the moon, and we will need either construction workers to build these plants, or we can use 3D printers to construct these manufacturing facilities, and these factories would make larger and more complex products. For example, glass. Glass coming from the lunar surface is strong, resistant to temperatures of extreme heat and cold, and is unbreakable. They can be shaped into windows for space stations, O'Neill space habitats, and domes covering an area of a flat surface on the moon and be used for farming. Glass can also be used to form fibers, tubes, and rods. Think of the uses they could have. Other manufactured items would be bigger lunar structures, space vessels, habitats and factories, whole space stations, and the list would be endless. This could replace manufacturing facilities on Earth and launching them into space, otherwise escaping Earth's gravitational pull, and not doing this would save both fuel and money. Remember, the moon has only one-sixth of the Earth's gravity, so it's easier to launch materials from the moon rather than from Earth. Manufacturing plants would be set up by other companies making the lunar settlement into an industrial park with room for expansion. This is how the lunar settlement would eventually grow into a city. As materials are processed and used for producing machinery, vehicles, and parts, companies would come in. More accommodations would have to be built for these workers, and agricultural farms would have to expand, producing more food for these workers. Lunar regolith, incidentally, would be used more and more for soil to grow more crops. 
After it is processed and the metals are removed, it could be distributed under a dome where the soil would be plowed with organic materials and used for growing more crops. Farm animals would later come into the scene, starting with rabbits, then poultry, and later sheep. Beef would eventually come in, but not for a very long time, as in decades, if ever. So with all this industry and food production taking place, the moon would become a self-sustaining and self-supporting economy. The last question is, what does the moon have to offer that other industries don't? What products would the moon produce that would make it unique? How would they be different from Earth's made merchandise? First, besides glass, would be lunar concrete, being crushed lunar rocks mixed with cement paste, reinforced with steel or glass fibers, thereby increasing flexibility and strength to restrict the growth of microcracks. This means greater strength, heat resistance, better radiation shielding, and abrasion resistance, especially against micrometeorites. It would be of good use on the moon and help expand the lunar base. This would start with building lunar shelters and then be used for space stations, habitats, and factories. Imagine exporting it to Earth. Demand would go up, helping to expand the lunar economy. We know the value of oxygen. What about helium-3? Helium-3 is in plentiful supply on the lunar surface and is replenished by the sun's rays, and it will be very useful with the perfection and marketing of nuclear fusion technology. But it is equally useful as it is now. Here are a few examples. It is used in quantum computing where, in extremely low temperatures, interference would be reduced in calculations and increasing their accuracy. It can be used in devices to detect nuclear materials and prevent smuggling of nuclear bombs in suitcases. It can also be used in medical imaging, especially in lungs, making it easier to treat diseases like asthma and cystic fibrosis. When helium-3 is mined on the moon, it will no doubt be an economic bonanza way beyond the gold rushes of yesteryear. In the meantime, lunar minerals and materials processing are the way to go. Materials processing on the moon is like materials processing in space, only that the moon is one-sixth gravity instead of near-zero gravity. But that's okay. Much of these properties of these materials have already been analyzed, being density, strength, thermal conductivity, and electrical properties. With low gravity and a vacuum, there is more purity and direct access to the lunar environment, which would mean cleaner and purer chemicals, medicines, and crystals, just like in space. Different chemicals and metals, like in space, could be mixed on the moon that can't be mixed on Earth because of Earth's gravitational effects on different chemicals and metals. Some of the major elements of value found on the moon are silicon, magnesium, manganese, chromium, iron, aluminum, titanium, and calcium, nickel iron, and platinum group metals, including gold. Alloys can be formed, but much stronger than on Earth. Superconductors at room temperature can finally be marketed. Construction materials for habitats, even O'Neill space habitats, would be manufactured and exported to space. The entire space infrastructure can be built without importing anything from Earth, except maybe seeds for plants of all sorts. I have mentioned advanced medicines and medical technology performed on the moon, along with growing crystals for advanced electronics and manufacturing solar panels, both for space in the form of solar power satellites and on the moon, and this is a category all its own. There would be continued scientific investigation and experimentation with minerals, low gravity, the vacuum of space, radiation, lunar geology, astronomy, including radio astronomy on the far side of the moon. Scientific investigation would be indefinite, and we would need it, 
How do we transport lunar resources? Large scale transport of lunar material, be it regolith, oxygen, or separated metals, can be accomplished by launching small payloads by a mass driver. Proposed by the late Gerard O'Neill, a mass driver is an electrical device that runs for several kilometers on a track along the lunar surface. Payloads of any material are accelerated to a high velocity along this track. Small vehicles called buckets contain superconducting coils to carry these payloads. These buckets are accelerated by pulsed magnetic fields and are guided by inducted magnetic fields set up in a surrounding guideway. Upon reaching the correct velocity, the buckets release their payloads where they accelerate into space towards Earth. The buckets are then slowed for recirculation for reuse. At a fixed point in space, possibly at L2, there is a mass catcher to catch the material ejected by the mass driver. The material is then retrieved and sent to either low Earth orbit for processing or to Earth. A mass driver would save transportation costs and propellant for otherwise rocketing the material to Earth. This process would commence upon the development of space mining and industries. The first materials to be transported could be lunar oxygen for the way station, later lunar regolith and raw materials for Earth orbiting processing plants would be would follow. Perhaps you can summarize some other lunar products that would make the moon a strong and competitive economy. There are almost an infinite amount of products we haven't even mentioned in this podcast, and I can't even begin to cover them all. The development of the moon's resources will result in a lunar industrial output whose ultimate magnitude is impossible to fully anticipate. It is clear that it will include raw stock from mining and refining resources as there is a vast number of products. I'll go on a spiel here. These products will include sheet metal and trusses of aluminum, magnesium, titanium, iron, or alloys, castings, bars, wires, powders of pure or alloyed materials, glass, glass wool, ceramics, refractories, fibrous and powdered ceramics, insulation, conductors, metals, These products will include sheet metal and trusses of aluminum, magnesium, titanium, iron, or alloys, castings, bars, wires, powders of pure or alloyed materials, glass materials, glass wool, ceramics, refactories, fibrous and powdered ceramics, insulation, conductors, adnodized metals, coating, including the most perfectly reflective sodium coating. Note that sodium can be freely used on the moon and in zero gravity, where on Earth it reacts with water and is dulled by oxidation. Thin film materials, silicon chips, solar cells, entire structures of various metals and alloys for lunar and orbital installations, they do not have to be weather resistant, compound and fibrous materials, heat shields and insulation materials, as well as radiation shielding materials for space stations. Propellant containers, entire orbiting facilities, such as space stations and factory modules, and liquid lunar oxygen depots, large portions of cislunar and interplanetary spacecraft, even fuel cells from platinum group metals, and so on. More advanced products would be habitats for moons, Mars, and space stations, propulsion systems for ships, fuel cells, space vessels, and components for solar power satellites. There will even be luxuries like lunar jewelry for the love of your life, but I won't get into that there. To summarize, lunar resources will offer vast opportunities and coming industries for anyone willing to make the investment. And I have mentioned a lot here. So when the moon is first settled, it will greatly expand, benefiting all humanity. Technologies in all fields will advance, making the moon a safe and prosperous place to live on and work. The resources on the moon will create a diverse but thriving economy. 
As this progresses, the growth in population, technology, and economics will accelerate exponentially, making the moon one of the most prosperous and richest places in the solar system. This isn't going to happen overnight, but it will happen. As we settle, mine, and process lunar materials, we will find creative uses for them and sell manufactured products back to Earth. Lunar industry will advance and come into its own. Now, Alistair, tell us about your next podcast. Before I do, I would like to point out that there is another anecdote at the end of this chapter. Want to know what it is? You have to find out for yourself. Next week, we come to the last chapter, Chapter 10, Settling Mars. This sounds far into the future, but there are many Mars advocates out there, and the time may come sooner than you think. That does sound fascinating. I know that this has been a complicated podcast, probably the most complicated of the 11 that uh, I am eventually going to do. But anyway... I would like to thank you, Veronica, and thank all of you, the listeners, for tuning into this podcast. You can learn a lot from these podcasts, and you can learn a lot from the book Cosmic Careers. Don't forget to buy your own copy from the net, or you can order it at your local bookstore. Come back next week. Bye. Bye.